Hello once again. I'm hoping uh, we won't get too much noise interference. I've had Polair circling overhead for the last half hour, but uh, hopefully he'll go away and won't bother us. If you try reading through a Bible book like Ephesians, you will very quickly come to such words as heavenlies, predestined, adoption, redemption, and revelation. And those terms sound significant, and they are, because they uh, reveal profound aspects relating to the subject of salvation. But as we focus on words like the ones I've just mentioned, we risk losing the significance of certain other words that are shorter. Um, for instance, take the word in, I-N. That's a quite commonplace word. We um, use it every day. It doesn't uh, appear to have any great theological significance. And yet, according to Unger's Bible Handbook, the word in appears in the book of Ephesians around 90 times, on average 15 times per chapter. And Unger goes on to say this, the fact of the believer's position in Christ permeates the entire thought of the epistle. So the observation is that this word in, though very short, uh, in fact is, has a central role. Uh, in this teaching letter, this epistle. The letter to the Ephesians is written to a congregation of Christians in the city of Ephesus, which was at the western end of what is now Turkey. And in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1, the Christians there are described as being in Christ Jesus. Uh, they're described uh, as the faithful there and the saints that doesn't refer to dead super Christians uh, the saints simply means sanctified holy and that is done for us through salvation the point about these is that the Christians are in Christ but it's not just Christians who are in Christ as we go through this book, we find that there are many blessings, many blessings, which are in Christ. We'll just take the time to look at verses 3 through to 14. And there's a great deal said just there. For instance, starting in verse 3 of Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Notice there, God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. That means nothing has been left out. That reminds me of a somewhat similar passage over in Second Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellent, by which he has granted to us uh, uh, his precious and very great promises. And it continues on. But notice there, he has granted to us all things pertaining to life and godliness, just as in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 uh, God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. God hasn't overlooked anything at all from a spiritual point of view. And these spiritual blessings are in the heavenlies in Christ. Uh, your Bible, just like mine, may well have heavenly places. But if you go to the original Greek, there's just one word in the Greek, and that is the heavenlies. And that word appears five times in the letter to the Ephesians. And it's not exactly heaven. Um, we can see that if we go over to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, 
against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenlies. So the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenlies. The best way to sum it up is that we're talking about the heavenly realm, the spiritual realm uh, in which we exist and it's connected with heaven of course but we exist in it even here on earth and we're engaged in a spiritual battle uh, against uh, evil forces, evil influences and so forth. But the significant point in verse 3 is God has given us uh, every a spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. We go on into verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. So God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's related to the word predestination which follows in verse 5. And that's a difficult concept to grasp, and there are various views. Some have taken the view that it means that way before creation, God decided who was going to be saved and who was going to be lost. That had nothing to do with them. Uh, there's nothing we can do about it. We can't change the situation. That's the way God has made it. Um, but that really doesn't fit in with a range of biblical verses. Uh, most people have some familiar familiarity with John 3 and verse 16. Let me just read that uh, along with verse 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God was acting for the salvation of the world. And you can tie that in with Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. See, God again is wanting all to seek repentance. Now we can choose whether or not to accept God's gift, but nevertheless the desire and the invitation is there on God's part. But what some people do, they add qualifying phrases to verses such as these. God's looking for the salvation of the world, at least for those whom he's chosen in the world. But those qualifying phrases don't appear in any of these passages. So it's not saying God has arbitrarily chosen some to be saved and condemned the rest to be lost. Rather, God here in Christ has chosen some to be holy and blameless. And his choosing, his predestining, if you like, is linked to his foreknowledge. God knows things ahead of time. He knows people ahead of time. Uh, you can see that in Romans 8 and verse 29, for example. Um, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, those whom he foreknew. Or we can go over to 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning there in verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So they are elect, they are chosen according to God's foreknowledge. Incidentally, those places that are mentioned there uh, all existed at the west western end of what is now Turkey. So uh, a second point here in Ephesians 1 verse 4, Christians were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. We can go on to verse 5. Uh, in regard to this, verses 5 and 6. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. 
And I recognise there's a whole lot of things in these verses. But he's talking about being predestined to adoption as sons, to adoption into his family as his children, uh, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved, and the beloved here is Christ. So again, he's acted by giving us something in Christ, by giving us a number of things that are in Christ. We've already talked here about uh, being predestined, and that is in accord with uh, God's purpose, and that in turn uh, is in relation to God's grace, which is in Christ. And grace here uh, translates a word which uh, is defined uh, by W. E. Vine as meaning this, the friendly attitude which God has towards us, which leads him to treat us with kindness. God has a friendly attitude towards us and he treats us kindly. He wants to save us. And again, this is in Christ. We can go on and read verses 7 and 8. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. So there again you've got grace, grace which God lavished upon us. But at the beginning of verse 7, in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, of our sins. And I've talked at various times about how through Jesus' sacrifice the penalty for sin was paid, thus enabling God to release us from our guilt and to forgive us. Uh, but the, uh, the word redemption here translates a Greek word meaning uh, to release on payment of a ransom. And we're all familiar with that idea. We've heard of kidnappings involving a ransom. The idea here is Jesus paid the price through his death, the shedding of his blood, the giving of his life. He paid the price to release us from the grip of sin, from the grip of guilt, from the grip of Satan, all of these things. And we have this in him. We can uh, go down to verses 9 and 10 here. Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So God has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ. What's the mystery? Well, that's not so difficult. It's explained for us over in Ephesians chapter 3. Mystery defines something that uh, has not been clearly revealed and will not be understood without God letting it be known. Well, God has let it be known. Chapter 3 and verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of, for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which has not been made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. The mystery in earlier times, in Old Testament times, was the fact that God was planning to save Gentiles and Jews alike through Jesus. In other words, God was planning to bring salvation for all through Jesus Christ. That was not uh, grasped in the past but it was made clear through the New Testament apostles and prophets. And then we have that this purpose which was set forth in Christ involved a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things 
in him things in heaven and things on earth and what does that mean it's a rather difficult concept to grasp but uh, in one way or another God was planning through Christ to bring things together uh, you get a reference to this in Colossians if you go over a couple of books Colossians chapter 1 verses 19 and 20 for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven making peace by the blood of his cross so again there's this idea of bringing things together and a clue to that lies in Romans the 8th chapter and we can read there from verse 19 Romans 8 and verse 19 for the creation waits with eager longing for the revelation uh, sorry I'll start that again for the revealing of the sons of God for the creation was subjected to futility not willingly but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God so there's the idea here that the creation was subjected to futility. That wasn't the way God originally made things. What we see in the world is not part of the original creation, but it was subjected to futility as a consequence of sin. And we can see that uh, described in uh, Genesis, the third chapter. But with the coming of Jesus Christ, the conquest of Satan, the conquest of sin, the provision of forgiveness there is a bringing back together sin if you like destabilized things and god in christ was bringing things back together in the way that he intended for them to be but that's still not the end of it we go down into verses 11 and 12 in him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory but here in Christ we have obtained an inheritance something great that comes as a result of us being in, uh, being adopted as God's children and you can read about that over in 1 Peter chapter 1 beginning in verse 3 this describes the inheritance that Christians have blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ according to his great mercy he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable undefiled and unfading kept in heaven for you and it goes on there but in christ we have been given an inheritance and then we go on to verses 13 and 14 of ephesians 1 in him you also when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised holy spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory so in christ you were sealed with the promised holy spirit what does that mean well seal translates a greek word indicating to have a mark showing ownership uh, showing source if you like uh, for instance i have here my certificate of australian citizenship and on the bottom here you might see the red circle is a seal showing it to be authentic showing it to come from uh, the uh, proper government department but also you'll notice here in ephesians 1 and verse 14 that the holy spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance and guarantee uh, in the king james version it's the word earnest translates a greek word which has the idea of deposit or down payment uh, i used to work in motor vehicle finance and truck finance people put a deposit on a car or a truck holding it for them until such time as payment is fully made uh, perhaps you've bought a house when you first uh, 
started that process, you put down a deposit. And so it is here that the Holy Spirit is given to Christians, number one, as a mark showing that we belong to God, and number two, as a pledge of future inheritance. And that too is in Christ. And we've only got down to chapter 1 and verse 14. But already here we can see that in Christ, Christians are blessed with every spiritual blessing. In Christ, Christians were chosen before the world's foundation. In Christ, Christians were predestined for adoption through grace. In Christ, Christians have redemption and forgiveness. In Christ, Christians know God's will according to his purpose. In Christ, Christians have obtained an inheritance. And in Christ, Christians have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And there's still five more chapters to go in that book. So all of these blessings which are given are given in Christ. And the point is that that is where Christians are also. Christians are in Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. And there's repeated references elsewhere to the fact that Christians are in Christ. For instance, if um, Romans chapter 6 and verse 11, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Or Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith so if we want the blessings that are in christ that is where we need to be but what does it mean to be in christ let me read you some definitions here first starting with richard lensky uh, the word in uh, or the equivalent greek word denotes a vital spiritual connection so that we translate in connection with. So in, uh, as used here, the Greek word is indicating a connection with Christ. Uh, reading from Bauer's Greek English lexicon, uh, the word means to indicate a very close connection, to designate a close personal relation of Christ. And then Thayer's Greek-English lexicon, of that which any person or thing is inherently fixed, implanted, or with which it is in intimately connected. So all through these definitions is the idea of close connection. Just reading a bit more of Thayer, of a person to whom another is wholly joined and to whose power and influence he is subject so that the former may be likened to the place in which the latter lives and moves, so used in the writings of Paul and of John, particularly of intimate relationship with God or with Christ, and for the most part involving contextually the idea of power and blessing resulting from that union. So again, close connection, close relationship. If, in, if you are in Christ, you are closely connected with Christ. You have a close relationship with Christ. Every spiritual blessing that we receive in that relationship has been given by God as a result of Jesus Christ. Spiritually speaking, if it wasn't for Christ, we would be nothing and we would have nothing. Christ is the key to who we are as Christians and what we have. Everything is in him, in connection with him. So the big question is, how do we come to be in Christ in order to receive the blessings 
that are in Christ. We have a bit of a clue in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, was sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So there is the idea of hearing the gospel and of believing. And of course, some people will say, that's all we need to do, just hear it and believe it. Well, experience itself in the religious world shows that that's not the way it is. And certainly the Bible shows that there's more to it than that, because at various times here in the New Testament, uh, we see that belief is used as a sort of summary word that c contains various aspects of our response. For example, we read in Acts chapter 2 and verse 44 that all who believed were together and had all things in common. It's talking there about Christians. But who were those who had believed? Well, they were those who in verse 38 had been told by Peter to repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. They were those who, we're told in verse 41, had been baptised. And there was about 3,000 of them who had been baptised. That's all contained there in the description of those who had believed. You can go over to Acts, the 16th chapter, where we're dealing with the Philippian jailer and his family. And it says there in Acts 16 and verse 34, in the latter part of that verse, he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. And yet you read in verse 33 that they had also been baptised. You can go over to Acts chapter 19, uh, Paul's early days in Ephesus there, and he finds some people who are trying to follow Jesus Christ, but they don't know about the Holy Spirit. And so Paul asked them about their baptism. And, so, and they tell him they were baptised according to John the Baptist's baptism. And Paul talks to them about the fact they need to be baptised into Christ. And it's when that takes place that Paul lays hands upon them and they receive the Holy Spirit. So again and again, we see this idea that uh, being in Christ involves hearing the gospel and then everything that is tied up with belief and that includes repentance and baptism and if you've still got a problem with that well look for example at Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 and we read there do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death there it says plainly, you're baptised into Christ Jesus. We'll go back to Galatians 3, verses 26 and 27. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you who were baptised into Christ have, been, have put on Christ. So there you see faith and baptism together. So if we want to be in Christ where all spiritual blessings are, then we need to hear the gospel, we need to believe, we need to repent, in other words, change our ways, turn away from sin, and we need to be baptised into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. None of us who are Christians has earned or deserved salvation or any other spiritual blessing. We can't say that it's because we're so great. None of us has earned or deserved a close personal relationship with God the Father or Jesus Christ. Why? Because we're all sinners, just like everybody else in this world. We're all sinners. Every spiritual blessing comes to us in connection with Jesus Christ. So for us to receive spiritual blessings, then we need to be in Christ. We need to turn to Christ. We need to walk with Christ. We need to remain with Christ. That calls for faith, repentance, baptism, and then for ongoing faithfulness. In spiritual terms, Without Christ, we have nothing. 
with Christ, we have everything. We are totally in debt to Jesus Christ. We owe him our deepest gratitude. We owe him our loyalty. We owe him our service. We owe him our dedication. Because we rely totally upon him. Because it's in connection with him and him alone that we have salvation and hope and every spiritual blessing. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your gift of Christ. Thank you that although there is so much sin and evil in the world, your desire is to bring about forgiveness and salvation and eternal life. And you do that through Jesus, who gave his life to pay the penalty for our sins and to set us free. We thank you that he was willing to pay such a penalty. He knew the, uh, the agony that it would involve. He knew that it meant giving up his place in heaven with you, coming to this earth and then suffering uh, the agony of crucifixion and experiencing death. But as he said at that time, your will be done. And he went ahead with these things and then you raised him up, showing that he is indeed the saviour that he is indeed Lord and that he is now with you. And we need to turn to him. And we thank you that in your word, you have told us all that we need to know so that we can find out about you and about him and about how we can turn to you through him and walk with you by walking with him. Father, help us to be honest enough and open enough to see our need for you and for Christ and for your grace and thus to let go of our pride, our independence and instead turn to you in humility and submission. And we pray this through Christ our Saviour. Amen. Thank you take, for taking the time once again to listen. Uh, for some of you, as for many, this coming week may well be the time when you return to work uh, after the Christmas New Year break. Uh, it's just raced by once again. But if you are going back to work this week, I hope everything goes well to you as you get back into the routine. But one way or another, whatever be uh, your plans for this coming week, I pray that all will go well for you and that we can be together again next time. Until then, as always, take care. Bye for now.